main character, John Lee Cunliffe, and his thoughts on loneliness. And I suppose the thing about December really is um, an exposition of a soul that's kind of wrecked by loneliness. You know, he's a guy who's in the world on his own. He's been, he's 24, so the word orphan kind of will it, but still fine no matter what. He's lost his parents. Um, he has inherited a small farm that he's living on, and he's suffering from a, a kind of Hamletian inability to act. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know whether to lease his land to the neighbours or to sell it. He's under awful pressure, um, and suddenly the land is rezoned, so the pressure he's under is um, exponentially increased. But he, he spends most of his time thinking and finds it very hard to express himself, as a lot of men in John's situation do. Um, and really, I wrote this book about people like John C. Cunliffe, who's the main character, because, as you all know, they are everywhere. People who are in the margins, who are friendless, who are silent, who are completely, you know, insular um, and, you know, suffering, really, silently. Um, and we all walk past them every day and we don't know it. Um, and there probably are a lot more John C. Cunliffe's in the world than we care to admit to ourselves. So this is John Lee thinking about really his situation and the darkness of it. And it, it sounds very dark, but there is a lot of humour in the book, a lot of light as well. Christ does a great stretch in the evenings. March already, imagine. March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. With Jesus, the year is pure solid flying. The worst of the cold is gone anyway, thanks be to God. Daddy would make these same observations every year at the start of March. He would also give his predictions for the weather to come. The quantity and location of slugs and beetles and other creepy crawlies. The hop of a cock robin. The zigzag of rabbits and foxes across fields. The colour of the evening shadow cast by the Ara mountains on the fields that cuddled up to their feet. The early or late departure or return of migrating birds and the height of their flight. All of these things and more spoke to Daddy of the temperament of the coming season in a secret language of signs and signals. Yara stopped spouting, Mother would say, and rolled her eyes towards heaven. But then you would hear her repeating Daddy's predictions word for word to her friends, the ICA biddies, when they drank tea and had currant cake and clucked in the kitchen in his ooh and ah and wonder at Daddy's knowledge and skill and nods to each other knowingly and say, Now, how's them feckers in the Met Office and all their smartness wouldn't tell us that? <laughs> Loneliness covers the earth like a blanket. It flows in the stream, down through the callows to the lake. It's in the muck in the yard, and the briars in the haggard, and the empty outbuildings are bursting with it. It runs down the walls inside the house like tears, and grows on the walls outside like a poison choking weed. It's in the sky, in the stones, in the clouds, in the grass. The air is thick with it. You breathe it into your lungs, and you feel it might suffocate you. It runs into hollow places like rainwater. It settles on the grass and on trees and takes their shape and all the earth is wet with it. It has a smell like the inside of a saucepan, scraped metal, coal and sharp. When it hits you, it feels like a rap of a hurl across your knuckles on a frosty winter's morning at the E. Sharp, shocking pain, but inside you, so it can't be seen, and no one says sorry for causing it, nor asks are you okay, and no kind teacher wants to look at it and tut tut and tell you to be grand, good lad. But you know, if another man stood where you're standing and looked at the same things, he wouldn't see it or feel it. He'd see that the fields are only wet with you, and the walls only running because the vents are blocked with dirt and grime, and it's Virginia Creeper that climbs the house, that people used to stop to admire for its lovely, fiery colours and her passage up the yard towards the front door. So it only exists in your head. It only occupies a tiny space. Is it even an inch squared? Probably not. How big is a field? Not even as big as one of them atoms that the science teachers be on about. It's nothing and everything at the same time. The world doesn't change, nor anything in it, when someone dies. The mountains keep their still strength, the sun its heat, the rain its wetness. Blackbirds still hop and flutter about the back lawn, fighting over worms. The cat still screeches and paws at the back window for her grub. Bees still dance about the flowers and the apple trees, always searching, searching. There's an awful cruelty in the business of nature, in the brutal sameness of things. The sky was the same blue the day after Daddy died as it was the day before. The uncaring rain didn't stop while they buried Mother, 
only bucketed ignorantly down and ran in muddy rivers from the height to the road below.